Welcome to Hospitals of Plymouth, 250 Years uh, in Historical Context, uh, a presentation of the Plymouth Historical Society. I'm Dr. Doug McVicker, and uh, <clears throat> my colleague, Dr. John Richards, and I originally presented this at the old Webster Courthouse in December 2018. Um, we're now taping it for the benefit of people that couldn't see it then on uh, January 15th. 2019. Um, <clears throat> we're trying something um, a little bit different today. This is one uh, presentation, but um, it involves uh, two um, separate talks. Dr. John Richards has a special treat for us. He has recovered the lost history of the hospitals of Plymouth all the way back to the uh, planning uh, before the first 1899 hospital was built. By combining standard references and records generously shared by Spear Memorial Hospital and developing numerous completely new sources, Dr. Richards is the first person to ever put the whole jigsaw puzzle together and reveal the long panoramic view of the story of the hospitals of Plymouth, Campton, and Holderness. My job is to put a frame around that amazing panorama, a frame of historical context. We wouldn't know time was passing if things didn't change. Thinking about history is largely thinking about change. <clears throat> this type of uh, chart, uh, an engram chart, can help show that change. The chart shows the use of terms uh, in books over a period of time. In this case, we've selected a period of time roughly corresponding to the history of Plymouth from its 1760 founding up to the present day. You'll notice that in the early years, by far the, the dominant uh, idea that was written about, probably thought about and talked about in medical care was physic. The word physic, sometimes spelled with a K, comes from the ancient Greek word for nature. Now, today, if somebody tells their doctor they took a physic, they mean that they took a laxative. But the word is actually very old and has a very uh, honorable tradition it has many meanings, including medications and potions of all kinds, not just laxatives, and, but also healthy habits, the science of the human body, and mental or physical healing practices. Now, <clears throat> if you look right at the uh, area where uh, physics drops down and crosses the line, which is labeled medical care, you're looking at right about the time that the first hospital in Plymouth was founded. Uh, medical care has a different implication, I think, than physics. When people started using that term, they were differ differentiating it from physic. Uh, it's a more technical and scientific-based form of treatment. And that's what hospitals were built to, built to accomplish. Um, and we'll be focusing right on this era where the two lines, physic and medical care, crossed. Uh, this is an extraordinary time in the, in the history of uh, the United States and also of Europe. Uh, it's the period of the birth of the modern hospital. Hospitals are quite an interesting and unusual historical um, institution, unlike something else you might study, uh, forts, cities, churches, businesses. Uh, <clears throat> the hospitals weren't founded a few um, in the 17th century, more uh, in, on the eastern seaboard in the 18th century, more still moving toward the Midwest in the 19th century and into the 20th and 21st century. Instead, hospitals were all founded in a very short period, which brackets our own experience here in Plymouth maybe 25 years before and 25 years after the founding of the Emily Balch Soldiers and Sailors Hospital in 1899. Um, those hospitals, for some reason, which we're going to try and explore today, sprouted like mushrooms after the summer rain. And uh, the, <clears throat> we can see, if we look at this slide of hospitals, and uh, numbers of hospitals in the United States, that there were almost no hospitals in 1870. They were rare, modern hospitals. 
in, in 1923, there were 40% more hospitals than there are today. The growth was, was incredibly fast. Um, <clears throat> and Plymouth Hospital, not surprisingly, was born right into the uh, middle of this uh, boom. Um, here we have uh, a, uh, a path along uh, and, um, uh, and, and uh, amazing path of uh, American history. On this uh, path, they've uh, removed half of the 18th century and almost all of the 17th century, but still it's a long path and you can see um, the revolution moving forward through the Great Depression. And within that red oval is the very brief period in which hospitals uh, uh, were founded. Um, on the right side is a timeline of some of the local hospitals that we know. I'd like to just kind of give you an idea of what a short period that's compressed into. First in 1866, we have Mount, Au Mount Auburn Hospital in Cambridge. 1874, Maine Medical Center. 1884, Portsmouth Cottage Hospital. 1889, Johns Hopkins Hospital. 1890, the Elliott Hospital. 1891, Concord Hospital. 1892, Catholic Medical Center. 1893, Royal Victoria Hospital, Montreal. 1893 again, Mary Hitchcock Hospital. 1896, New England Deaconess. 1897, Lakes Region, then right in the middle in green, Emily Balch Spear Memorial Hospital, our very own, 1899. 1907, Littleton Hospital. 1910, Franklin Regional Hospital. 1911, Memorial Hospital, North Conway. 1913, Peter Ben Brigham Hospital. 1916, Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. 1923, the Leahy Clinic. Why such an abrupt development? We're going to look at some of the factors that came together to produce this eruption of hospitals throughout the Western world uh, in a few minutes. But first, let's take uh, a look at another chart. This is the one we saw before, but there's a question mark now over that small number of hospitals in 1870. I was really surprised when I first put the numbers together and saw this. How could that be? Weren't there hospitals in ancient times? in Greece and Rome? Weren't there hospitals in medieval Europe, the Hotel Dieu? Well, uh, yes, sort of, but mostly, no, not really. There were institutions that we use the word hospital for, but they were fundamentally different from modern hospitals. Here's an um, old print of a medieval hospital. Can you see what the women in the lower left-hand corner are doing? They're sewing bodies into shrouds for burial. These hospitals, some of them were really houses of death. <clears throat> if you look at the patients, if those are in fact patients because most of the people served by hospitals weren't sick. They had other types of reasons that they needed charity. But if they're sick, since most of the serious diseases were contagious diseases, putting two in a bed like that is not a good idea. And yet, Looking carefully, we see that the sick are happy. They're happy because their suffering is being relieved while they await their eternal reward. The caregivers are happy because they have an opportunity to so, show mercy, piety, and charity. The wealthy nobleman is happy because he has an opportunity to spend his fortune in a way that will help him open the doors of heaven. What is he praying for? Well, one thing he's almost certainly not praying for is for the patients to be cured. He is likely praying for God to take their immortal souls and his own. So here we have a picture of tender care, yes, but not effective treatment. Effective treatment was rare, and if and when it occurred, it was incidental to the true purpose of these pre-modern hospitals, which was to give charity. Men and women could ease suffering when it occurred. That was a commandment of Christ but they would not have imagined that they could or should attempt to alter God's great plan and his dominion over sickness and health and over life and death. This attitude, I'm sure, is, is quite difficult for, for us uh, in our <clears throat> to fully understand today because our world is so different than, than that world. Uh, what's changed uh, is, I believe, one of the greatest forces in the history of the West. 
the Enlightenment. During the Enlightenment, the concept of in individual self rose to great prominence. The feelings, thoughts, ideas, and aspirations of each person became prominent. They were important. Individual uh, freedoms, such as freedom of speech, freedom of association, and freedom of religion began to make a lot of sense in the context of the Enlightenment. Governments are instituted among men, our Declaration of Independence tells us, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, not by any divine plan nor any natural rights of monarchs. Individual people had souls, wills, and independence of thought if they wished to push back against illness, and of course, they usually did, this was not blasphemy. In fact, from the viewpoint of the Enlightenment, and from our viewpoint today, it was natural and desirable. Now this Enlightenment idea, and all the ideas of the Enlightenment, didn't catch on right away. A conceptual revolution like this can take generations. But I think the point is profound, and I'd like to illustrate with an anecdote from the time when the Enlightenment change of attitude was just beginning and other attitudes were pushing back. <clears throat> now, now you'll hear in a little while uh, in John's presentation, he has a corker of an anecdote to make some of his points, so I thought I might be entitled to one too. John's takes place right here in Plymouth, mine uh, down in Boston. This is uh, the port of Boston in uh, 1723. Obviously, there were lots of comings and goings. And so, as you can imagine, the city was racked by epidemic uh, diseases coming in from all parts of the world. Uh, the worst among these diseases were measles, yellow fever, cholera, scarlet fever, and diphtheria, all lethal and uh, one of the worst was smallpox. In 1703, a smallpox epidemic killed over 300 Bostonians, <clears throat> and uh, this man, although he couldn't do about it, uh, anything about it at that time, uh, wanted to. Um, I invite you to look at the picture. You may recognize him, a fairly uh, famous early Bostonian, um, Go ahead and guess, um, and then I'll show you, yes, that's right, it's Cotton Mather. Uh, he's, of course, most famous for his uh, enthusiastic encouragement of the Salem witch trials. That doesn't seem like a very enlightened person, but remember, this is the transition. And he was an extraordinary man and an enlightened man in many ways. Uh, he had an extraordinary mind and an extraordinary fund of knowledge. During his lifetime, he authored over 400 publications in many, many fields. He began to hunt for an answer to the threat of smallpox, although he was not a physician. He knew it would eventually come back to Boston. Now, Cotton Mather had a slave, Onesimus. I, I think I should just say, I think we Yankees sometimes imagine that slavery was a southern sin only and we were above it. That is historically absolutely not the case. New Englanders were up to here in the sin of slavery. And Cotton Mather was given by his congregation a slave, Onesimus. Now Onesimus was an African man who said to Cotton Mather, who was looking for some help in the smallpox, uh, he said to to Cotton Mather, uh, I, Onesimus, cannot catch the smallpox because when I was a boy in Africa, they cut my arm and put a drop of smallpox fluid into the cut. And when it healed up, I was immune and would never get smallpox. Mather uh, took Onesimus seriously and uh, began to look into this. Smallpox uh, inoculation of this type had been practiced in many areas of the world for centuries, but not in Western Europe, England, or the United States. Cotton Mather was the first to initiate that. He prepared a plan, and just as he expected, smallpox returned uh, with a vengeance in 1721. He approached the medical community of Boston, which was quite small at the time, to get help because he was a minister, not a surgeon. And he was 
turned down by all ten of the doctors um, until he was finally able to persuade just one, one Zabdiel Boylston, who was uh, one of the best of uh, the doctors in Boston to participate. Zabdiel Boylston inoculated a, a 287 people during this epidemic and uh, there were only six deaths. This was 2%. Unfortunately, in the rest of the city, 14% died. That amounted to almost uh, one person in 10 in the population of the city. So you would think that this miraculous cure that Mather and Boylston had introduced to Boston would result in a claim uh, for them. And, and uh, kudos and um, acknowledgement of what they'd done. But actually, that wasn't the case. Uh, an angry lynch mob came after Zabdiel Boylston, and he had to go into hiding. Uh, and a bomb was thrown through the window of Cotton Mather's house. Now, there were many arguments raised against inoculation, but the one that best illustrates this transition between uh, Enlightenment thinking, what came before it, is the theological argument that was made in this particular broadside by a minister, John Williams. Uh, this one is interesting. If you look down at the bottom, you can see it was published by James Franklin. That's Benjamin Franklin's older brother. He taught Franklin the printing trade. John Williams attacked Boylston and Mather and the very idea of smallpox inoculation based on a theological argument. Here's what he wrote. I've updated the language just a little bit to make it easier to understand. Is not smallpox one of the strange works of God? And is not inoculation of it a fighting against the Most High? Is not smallpox a punishment from a righteous God upon a people for their sins? And hath it not a crying voice to them saying, cease to do evil and learn to do good? And will not the laboring to avert this righteous punishment by way of inoculation provoke God more and more? Attitudes are slow to change. And technology was even slower to change. Uh, here we see a um, interesting a point made by a Professor Rosen, a, a historian of, of science. And he says that uh, the um, uh, doctors who treated George Washington in his final illness really uh, were uh, very similar in, in their view of medicine and the human body to the doctors who treated Julius Caesar. They would have very much in common. Why, why should that be? Washington was born in the time of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment did greatly stimulate science. However, not all the sciences advanced together. Great progress was made early on in astronomy, mathematics, physics, optics, navigation, and uh, <clears throat> not so much in, in, the, in the science of the human body. That lagged by more than a century. So Dr. Rosen's point here is that Washington's doctors and Caesar's doctors alike, as a practical matter, had nothing to work with except external observations. To them, the human body was a black box with no understanding of anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, biochemistry, microbiology, and so forth. They couldn't even begin to imagine what was going on inside the body to produce the external manifestations that they witnessed. So to build a little bit on Dr. Uh, Rosen's um, surprising statement, let's consider one example of a patient with difficulty breathing. Both Washington's doctors and Caesar's doctors could recognize that the patient was having difficulty breathing. But there are dozens of specific conditions that cause difficulty breathing in different ways. <clears throat> Those doctors had no knowledge that would allow them to understand that. Unfortunately for their patients, it is the specific condition that needs to be treated, not the symptom. So what happened, what helps or cures one of those specific conditions might make another worse. Now, of course, there were mountebanks and quacks of all sorts 
in this time of unregulated practice of medicine. But I believe that the very best healers of the 18th and early 19th century in America did very well with what they had. Yes, their medicine was weak or even harmful, but their care could be excellent. Let's look at this chart, which shows again that same time period. The, the, the red line shows attending the sick, which was a very prominent idea that was written about and presumably read about early on. And the, the, the two lines, however, cross at an important point in history. Cure, ever since the beginning of the Enlightenment, had been something of interest, but curing uh, the sick uh, t takes precedence right at that point where the two lines cross. Now John and I were discussing this the other day and in fact we think that the best of these early physicians may well have outperformed recent generations of doctors in the caring department. Maybe we have a lesson to learn from them. How did those best doctors attend and care? The word attending means to be present, to pay attention, to listen, to sit and wait. <clears throat> These doctors were skilled family counselors. They were capable of advising and comforting when there was a serious or mortal illness in the family, even though they knew they couldn't cure it. They knew families in their practice well, often building relationships that lasted for generations. Dr. John Rogers, who came to Plymouth in 1782, was one of those practitioners who built relationships with families in his care over the generations. Dr. John Rogers himself uh, died uh, somewhat young, but his son, Dr. Samuel Rogers, who studied in Plymouth with his father, carried on the practice. The two Dr. Rogers served Plymouth and its citizens for some 70 years. Ezra Stearns, in his wonderful History of Plymouth, provides a beautiful description of the charismatic power that Dr. John Rogers exercised on behalf of both the growing town and its citizens. And I can do no better than to read Ezra Stearns' words to indicate to you how these attending physicians worked their powers to the benefit of um, their patients. Ezra Stearns writes, in town affairs, he, <clears throat> John Rogers, in town affairs he was an influential and intelligent citizen and an able promoter of the reforms of his time. He was many times called to preside in town meetings and was appointed frequently upon special committees. He was the first postmaster in this town and a member of the first board of school supervisors. His acknowledged skill and accomplished manners, his superior edu education and unfailing public spirit, won for him the confidence and affection of his patients and the unqualified respect of the community. A man of superior nature and cultured abilities, gentle, refined, and compassionate, Dr. Rogers would have been a bold and striking figure in any walk of life. As a physician, while healing the patient he touched, while healing the, the disease of the patient, he touched the mind with a wand of sympathy. <clears throat> and often the most potent remedy at his command was the healing of his presence. During this period when science lagged so far behind the healers, and the patient's ambition, which is roughly the period shown on this chart where the red line is above the blue line, there really was no reason to have a hospital. The medicine was very simple and didn't really work anyway. So why not be cared for at home, the most comfortable, familiar, and economical place with your friends and family around you? The most common caregiver in those days was a family member, often with little or no experience. So there arose a need that was met by a number of self-help manuals, many of which uh, became bestsellers. Um, 
Here are three of the ones that were most popular, um, in, uh, particularly in North America. In the lower left-hand corner, we, we um, see the manual uh, published by John Wesley. This is the John Wesley, the founder of Wesleyanism, who uh, also um, took it upon himself to improve the, the lives of the sick by providing a, a care manual that was widely used and went through many editions. Um, <clears throat> on the right, we see New Hampshire's own Samuel uh, Thompson. Uh, he developed a system of botanical medicine based on plants that uh, <clears throat> grew in the local landscape here. So his book was popular in uh, New England where these uh, uh, plant remedies were um, available. And um, <clears throat> to sort of fill out the diversity of these people, botanist, minister, on the upper uh, right-hand figure, we have an important literary figure, uh, Lydia Maria Child, who is known today um, well, for writing over the river and through the woods to grandfather's house we go, but also um, as a very uh, important essayist, novelist, uh, and even poet. Uh, she's the one that, um, that uh, battled uh, so ardently for uh, abolitionism and for uh, women's rights, and um, also was a pacifist. Um, she also was interested in the rights of Native Americans, and those of us in New Hampshire um, who have climbed Mount Chikoro may know the myth of Chief Chikoro. It's not really a myth, it's fiction that uh, she wrote and uh, published, it was quite popular in its day. Um, but she had to have a day job to uh, support her good works, and her day job was writing practical manuals uh, for women in, in the house. So um, she um, <clears throat> wrote this, uh, uh, a book um, for um, uh, the use of, of home caregivers, and it's full of um, practical advice. Um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to um, say that uh, sometimes um, the disease was too, uh, too dire, and the home caregivers needed to reach uh, out beyond their self-help books and their own knowledge and um, when they called for outside help there were a variety of caregivers that could come forward. Especially in the earliest uh, periods in New England, the best educated men in any town, the only educated men in many towns, would be clergymen. So they were um, drawn into practicing the healing arts. In some communities there, uh, there lived uh, experts in herbal lore whose traditions were passed down within the family or by apprenticeship. Uh, People who have read the uh, midwife's tale, a midwife's tale based on the uh, diaries of Martha Ballard, know that midwives didn't just deliver babies, but in this period they treated women, men, and children for wounds, infections, and epidemic diseases. And they prepared bodies for burial, part of the same continuum. Martha Ballard was also called on to serve as an expert witness in court. Uh, <clears throat> although there were outstanding examples, uh, uh, for example, John Rogers, of caring physicians in the, in the uh, 18th and early 19th century, the general populations of doctors, general population of doctors were, were disorganized, was a disorganized lot, varying widely both in the content and the quality of their training, and frequently squabbling among themselves about what disease was and what treatments, therefore, would make sense. You might think that they would come together to maintain as a dark secret the fact that their, treat that the, their treatments were unscientific, ineffective, and often dangerous. But instead of a conspiracy of silence, they devoted their efforts to producing a virtual circus of recrimination aimed at publicizing the failures of their competition. Doctors and patients alike raised the good question of whether the medical class was doing their patients more harm than good. Now, this chart uh, shows some of the most popular uh, treatments that were used, particularly in the 19th century. You can see that uh, some of these died off fairly slowly, persisted even into the later um, 19th century. But uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to mention um, some of these 
heroic treatments and, and the problems. Bloodletting is perhaps the most famous. It was widely practiced for non-existent conditions like excitation and imbalance of the humors. And it was even practiced prophylactically, that is, to prevent disease that was not present. Since the doctors, by and large, didn't know how much blood there was in the human body and didn't understand the physiology of shock and were trained to see symptoms uh, of life-saving exsanguination as the desired calming or rebalancing of the body, many deaths were caused. Lobelia, also known as pukeweed, is a strong herbal purgative advocated by uh, Samuel Johnson, New, New Hampshire's own botanist. It uh, can cause sweating, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, tremors, rapid heartbeat, which are the desired effects, but also confusion, convulsions, coma, and death. Uh, the father of one of Thompson's patients sued him when the young man died after aggressive therapy with lobelia. Calomel is uh, mercury chloride that is a very strong laxative and it was used for that effect. It can also be quite toxic. Uh, I think historians believe that uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's wife, Sophia, um, who was an important transcendentalist uh, critic, um, believed um, uh, that her um, headaches and, and neurologic symptoms were caused by treatment with calomel. Historians today, looking back on all this chaos, still can't give us a clear answer on the question of whether those physicians uh, were doing more harm on the whole than good. But we certainly can understand why so many people preferred to uh, just deal with their maladies themselves. But at the same time, uh, we have uh, at an accelerating pace as the 19th century went on, science opening up that black box that was the human body. For example, excellent uh, advances in public health, in quarantine and isolation were, were practiced successfully. John Snow famously halted a cholera epidemic in London by removing the handle of the Broad Street pump. Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, although they hated each other, um, worked together to, uh, or were, were, were both uh, discoverers and important figures in uh, finding the microorganisms that caused infection. But even before that, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. in Boston and Semmelweis in Vienna demonstrated how infections could be transmitted in the hospital and how that uh, transmission could be prevented. Anesthesia made surgery uh, more humane and safer. But these miraculous and effective treatments uh, were uh, things that couldn't be tucked into a doctor's bag and taken to a patient's home. So technology drove the public and the profession to demand hospitals, places that were ideal for practicing the new scientific medicine. And that's, I believe, one of the main reasons that the rapid build-out occurred in just 50 years between 1870 and 1920. If we look at this picture, which is an American operating room, right in this period when hospitals are, are blooming forth, we can see that the operators are wearing gloves, they're practicing sterile technique, they're wearing masks. They uh, also are using anesthesia. You can see the woman at the head of the patient giving anesthesia. So, <clears throat> the, the operating space is clear, and if you look at the top, you can see uh, bright lights. Um, within the hospital, besides the excellent uh, operating suite, um, there was a medical lab for blood counts and urinalysis. And uh, <clears throat> after uh, the mid-1890s, x-ray was an extremely important uh, diagnostic technology that was uh, desired everywhere and was best used in the hospital because special expertise and specially trained workers were required now, um, there's another factor besides technology, which I think is um, <clears throat> equally important. And let's just relabel this uh, slide. Um, and uh, it's uh, professional nursing. Um, here in the slide, you can see um, 
almost we almost looked beyond it when we first described the technology, but many people around the patient. Um, it's probably a good guess in that era that um, the women are nurses and the uh, men are doctors, but it's not necessarily true. By th this particular time, um, there were quite a few women doctors in certain cities in the United States. Um, I think that they, the, the uh, person that's giving the anesthesia, that woman may be a nurse or a, um, a doctor. Um, the gentleman that's standing without a, a mask uh, possibly might be a male nurse, although um, there were, and there were some male nurses at this time. But um, the point uh, is that um, professional nurses were essential to the development of hospitals, not only made it possible, but drove it uh, forward. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the uh, next uh, slide shows um, that nursing is very closely uh, correlated with the rise of hospitals in this particular period that we're talking about, uh, whereas physicians are not. So writing about physicians, reading about physicians, is essentially flat for a 300-year period here between 1700 and, and uh, the present day. But um, hospitals, uh, and, and hospitals, are, uh, that word was used, but they <clears throat> take off during this period of, of rapid hospital growth at the same time a practically parallel curve shows the growth of nursing. Why is this? Well, the two uh, hospitals and, and nursing, the two uh, institutions, were synergistic. Uh, doctors worked in their offices, they visited patients in their homes, they made rounds in hospitals. But nurses primarily worked in hospitals. That's what they were trained to do. They um, needed hospitals uh, to work in, and the daily operation of a hospital wouldn't have been possible without the nurses. So nurses needed hospitals, hospitals needed nurses. Uh, both uh, Clara Barton and Dorothea Dix, American uh, women, were important leaders in the development of hospitals. Uh, by far the single most important uh, person in the development of hospitals was this English woman, Florence Nightingale. Um, she was a excellent nurse, uh, she was a teacher, she was a founder of institutions, she was a thinker and a writer. And she wrote many books, but uh, just uh, two of them here I'd like to mention, um, Notes on Nursing and Notes on Hospitals that were, went through many editions and were tremendously influential, not just in England and North America, but in, in, in Europe as well. And um, look at what she advocated. She advocated nursing. Uh, as, a, as a profession, as hospital administration too is being taken seriously and as a profession. She said that to avoid um, wasted uh, energy uh, arguing uh, endlessly in circles that treatments needed to be evaluated statistically so we knew what was the right uh, treatment to administer the patient. She even um, got into a, a hospital um, architecture and felt that hospitals that were open and airy and well ventilated would be good for the, both the physical and mental healing of the patient. And of course, uh, sanitation was foundational. That seems obvious to us today. In Florence Nightingale's era, it um, was, it was re a revolutionary idea. Um, I think that nursing and uh, the rise of technology were the two main factors that drove the growth of hospitals in this period. But as you'll hear from John when he focuses in on our own town, there are a few other important factors. Uh, one of them was um, capital formation. Between 1870 and 1890, the United States became the biggest economy in the world. And um, so funds were available for all sorts of civic improvements. Uh, a second one uh, was philanthropy, largely driven by women, um, w which was a desire to use some of this capital uh, in uh, public institutions that, that, that benefited people. Um, I'd uh, quickly uh, cite an example here. The Johns Hopkins University was founded in 1899 with a major donation uh, of a large block of Baltimore and Ohio railroad stock. 
And uh, four years later, in 1893, there was a great demand for a medical school to be associated with a hospital and university. But there was a severe recession uh, and a huge dip in the value of that Boston, I mean, that uh, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad stock. Four wealthy women from Baltimore came forward to save the day. They agreed to raise the, the capital that was needed to found the Johns Hopkins University Hospital and Medical School provided that the school not only admit women, but admit women on an equal basis with men, which was done. And Johns Hopkins became one of the first places to do that. Uh, another factor was civic boosterism, and you can sort of guess by the proximity of the, uh, in time, of the founding of Lakes Region Hospital and Spear Memorial Hospital, that there was um, is certainly a little bit of civic uh, boosterism there too. So there's some other factors uh, besides the, the two main ones, driving at technology and nursing. And um, we'll um, see a wonderful uh, example of all this played out in, um, in uh, John's presentation, which uh, comes next. I'll turn it over to you, John. Thank you.